Okay. Okay. Let's start. Um, sorry about a little technical issue I had, but I think it's okay. Um, I have a treat today. Strawberries from our greenhouse. Yeah. It's not the best season, you know. The temperature is a little too warm. So pass around. <laughs> I hope we have enough number. <laughs> It's a local, Tucson local strawberry. All right. Okay. Sorry for the online students. <laughs> we can't share. Um, okay. So it's a, it's a Japanese, but most of them are Japanese. If it is tart and hard, it's American variety. <laughs> I wish it is a little bit sweeter, but, and then a little bit harder would be good. It's kind of soft side, yeah, because of temperature. So, but anyway, it's very different flavor profile. And uh, someday you have that access. <laughs> Yeah, all right. Okay, so, okay, so this is where we left Monday. Okay, um, but anyway, we are talking about water relation Monday and water potential to understand the water movement from point A to point B. And water potential has a, um, several components. Osmotic potential, which is associating with osmosis, right? Osmotic pressure. And uh, uh, pressure potential, which is basically turgor in plant system. And uh, matrix potential. So if you understand and sum up, then you get water potential. And then if the result is high in here and low in here, then water moves from high to low. At least the potential is that way. And then there might be resistance involved. So the actual water flux could be depending on the potential and then also resistance. Exactly the same way diffusion works. So it's basically diffusion based on water, you know, chemical energy of water, high energy site to low energy site. So it's so easy to understand once you understand the water potential. Okay. <laughs> You guys are so concentrating. <laughs> okay. Did you get strawberry? Yeah. What, what variety is that? Uh, either Nyoho or something, Japanese. Good, yeah. yeah. Okay, good. Right. So one of the things, so we, we talked about what? Tipan um, and uh, also Blossom and I wanted, I wanted to talk fruit cracking, which is also... Um, issue in greenhouse associating with water relation. Too much flux of water into the fruit burst, basically, the fruit. And it's a typical issue in cherry tomatoes, um, probably grapes. I don't know. Have you guys grown grapes in? Well, the, the fruit cracking, uh, my understanding is uh, grapes, usually the skin is um, harder, therefore you don't have much cracking issue in grapes, but more in cherries. Is that, do you agree with that? Yeah. Those who experience that? Okay. Yeah, so basically what's happening is, you know, so the flux of water, um, there are two ways. Um, xylem, which is basically, you know, water and uh, minerals, um, inorganic nutrients there, you know, pretty much transpiration related, xylem. And then fluorem, which is sugar water, which contains some amino acids and other things. But so the two flux going into the fruit, and then that flux is fluctuating based on the total, you know, the transpiration. Um, so, so if you look at, if you have any tool to look at the size of the, the fruit, it's actually moving. You know, there is a diurnal change. Shrink during the day, expand during the night. Because again, you know, we talked about push from the root pressure and pull from the leaf transpiration. 
So depending on the balance, the same thing, the, the, the fruit is affected, so just fluctuating, you know, during the day, during the night, during the day, during the night, and that movement, you know, creates um, micro cracks, you know, so, so that could be, so this, if, if you don't see them, that's going to be micro cracks. You can only see under microscope, but epidermal, you know, um, layer is um, basically cracked. And then if you have a burst of water pressure coming in or water flux coming in, then that's the time you start seeing big crack, big crack. And then typical condition is um, you irrigate um, during the time the sunlight is not so much, meaning poor by the transpiration is not so much, but you irrigate with nutrient solution and dilute the concentration um, of the salts in the root zone. So that would basically make the water potential less negative, right? So, so, the, so the, um, the water wants to come into the plant system and then eventually come into the fruit, and then that would basically uh, create the fruit cracking. So typical avoid uh, or um, procedure to avoid fruit cracking is to reduce that situation. For example, sudden change in the EC in the root zone is something you want to avoid. And you want to maintain uh, maybe early in the morning without any irrigation so that the, the grower's practice is, I know, is delaying the first irrigation of the day rather than at the sunrise, but maybe two, three hours later, so that plants are already, you know, transpiring, having more pull and less push, so that xylem, you know, pressure is a little bit more negative. So when it, the first irrigation starts, plants can absorb, but because xylem is already negative, therefore it doesn't cause too much flux to the fruit. So that's a typical, you know, solution of the uh, fruit cracking. We also did um, air movement. One of my graduate students earlier, so that more than 10 years ago, we worked on fruit cracking in cherry tomato. And then um, the most effective way was horizontal airflow. It's just moving horizontal airflow no matter what when we had the, you know, cracking. Cracking starts. Um, usually in the monsoon season, the humidity is up, BPD is low, so that, um, you know, the pool is not so much, so they tend to have a big pressure in the system, plant system, fruit cracking. So, so the air movement actually reduced the boundary layer, right, and enhance the transpiration, enhance the pool, because, um, um, uh, boundary layer is a resistance, right? One of the large resistances affecting transpiration rate. And then boundary layer is reduced by air circulation. So it's all connected, right? Boundary layer, air movement, water relation, BPD. Okay? All right, good. Good, good, good. All right, so, um, so, um, um, I think I have a few more slides from the Monday lecture. So I want to introduce one of the strategic use of um, managing um, water potential or salts concentration in a root system, in hydroponic you know, solution. So we are talking about salt stress um, and uh, water stress. And water stress happens when um, transpiration exceeds the water uptake rate, right? More pull than push. And that is something you want to avoid in general because it gives stress, therefore reduce the plant growth potentially, and therefore the yield of your crop production. Um, however, if you strategically use that, you can actually have a, um, a production of high flavor fruit. Um, so this is uh, one example. So increasing flavor of tomato by growing in a nutrient solution, um, having a little bit more salts. 
Um, and electrical conductivity, you learned that uh, last week, is a good indicator to adjust the uh, um, level of salinity or the concent total concentration of nutrients. And you can increase probably 100% easily by adding a lot of um, sodium chloride, which is the cheapest way to increase the EC. Um, rather than increasing all the you know, nutrient concentration, nitrogen, potassium, you can do the same way you know, um, by adding all the nutrients, but it's usually waste, um, uh, wasteful way to increase the EC. But anyway, so the typical application is just adding sodium chloride to the s solution and then increase the EC, and then that would basically reduce the transpiration flux a little bit, and then allocation to the fruit. Um, so, um, so the xylem and phloem going into the fruit, and both flux, both fluxes, um, the rates of the um, uh, flow are going to be reduced, and then the result is the concentration effect of the fruit, sugar and acid. So it, it does make the fruit a little bit smaller. Let's say doubling EC, the usual EC for tomato production probably 2.3 to 2. I don't know 8 or so, somewhere between 2 and 3 is typical incoming, you know, uh, EC in the solution, and then we can increase to 5, 5.5. Um, and then that, by that way, you get a little bit smaller fruit, maybe 10% less size, but you get much higher um, sucrose and um, acid concentration. So the bricks, we use bricks as an index to quantify the, the total flavor um, of the fruit, and then bricks can increase. So this is um, my um, master, master student, um, Johan did this experiment, but anyway, so this is a low EC cherry tomato. The bricks is six, um, and then high EC, which is 4.8 decisiemens per meter, um, and then the bricks is exceeding seven, and sometimes exceeding eight. And that one point of bricks difference is something you can actually taste, you can sense easily. Um, so cherry tomato exceeding eight as a bricks is almost tastes like a grape tomato, because that's the grape tomato range. So, um, and then it, this, this graph is showing uh, drainage EC. We, we try to manage drainage EC, but adjusting drip EC level um, by mixing a, a standard nutrient solution with sodium chloride. Um, but anyway, so the Blix is pretty much linear by um, EC level. So this is one way to use. And then a good, I think the, the um, good point of this kind of approach, um, you know, you, you can probably do the same and you can probably get the same quality by limiting water, um, you know, instead of just increasing EC, just limit the water and then um, uh, uh, give the water stress. But uh, w giving water stress by limitation of water is more challenging uh, because you, you don't know. Um, you might create wilting situation. But having high EC, plants always, always have access to water. Just a little bit difficult, more difficult to absorb. And by doing that, you can perfectly regulate you know, the water flux. Um, so that's a good thing. Um, however, one drawback, particularly for large fruit, uh, beef, uh, beef steak type, or TOV, tomato on vine, so the larger fruits than cherry, um, blossom end rot is, of course, the sometimes issue. So when you have a huge radiation in the greenhouse and then you do this high EC, then you might have, you know, you might see the blossom end rot. So you need to change the EC level based on how plants respond. So why blossom end rot happen in high EC? Yes, Haiti. 
calcium is not taken up because calcium is transported by mass flow and high AC limit the calcium transportation because reduced transpiration exactly. Okay, good. All right, so um, that's good. And then uh, um, let's talk about um, tip bands. So the blastamandrot is one of the calcium deficiency and two others as calcium deficiencies we talk about was were um, tip band and then one example was um, in lettuce, other example was um, in uh, strawberry. And uh, strategies for those three crops, if you remember, very different, but all based on calcium transportation. And then that's, that was driven by mass flow. So let's, let's go over and review why this is happening. Switch to Elmo. Same. All right. Yeah, so, okay. Um, Brassamendro, okay, BER. So, typical condition is dry climate, high radiation, Brassamendro. And then another one is high EC, okay? We talked about high EC. But when transpiration is driven in too much, so you have a massive, massive water flux going through the leaves, right? Because the leaves are the, the ones, you know, they, they have a bunch of tomatoes and then um, stomata, <laughs> no tomato, <laughs> on tomato, yeah. And then just, you know, driving um, moisture out, right? And then surface area is much bigger um, versus the surface of tomato, there is no stomata, okay? So if there is a massive flux going out, in that case, allocation to the fruit is going to be restricted, you know? And therefore, um, maybe the, when, when fruit is very small, I don't know, it doesn't show. Maybe fruit is, maybe here. The fruit is very small, you know, this style end, which also doesn't have much um, xylem going, therefore that tends to have the calcium deficiency. And then you start seeing that at this size, but it happens when they are growing very fast. You know, fruit is growing exponentially when it is much, much smaller green stage, right? Calcium deficiency happens, and then you start seeing that as a symptom in a, in a much larger stage. So that's and then also, I, I talked about high EC in the root zone, that would limit the push, okay? And then, even though the transpiration at normal rate, brassamendrot could happen because the total flux is going to be reduced because of the you know, lower push coming from the water potential difference between root zone and root system. So that's brassamendrot. Okay, let us tip on, right? Let us tip on, let us. Okay, so um, shoot tip here, okay? It's growing really fast, right? It's a growing point, growing very fast, and particularly under the conditions promoting plant growth. High radiation, CO2 enrichment in the greenhouse, and then growers are happy, happy, but usually see tip band. So typical solution for that, traditionally reducing radiation, lowering temperature so that slow down the growth. However, what we found, you know, many years ago now, is actually if, if you can enhance the localized transpiration around the shoot tip somehow, okay, then you can reduce the boundary layer resistance, right? Air circulation, air flow, boundary layer. Reduce the boundary layer, increased transpiration in this zone, and then eliminate tip band. The researchers proved that, remember, using a, the plastic tubings going into every single head of lettuce. It's a proof of concept. It's not the practical method, but 
the group of researchers wanted to demonstrate that's actually because they don't want to mess up with outer leaves transpiration. So just, you know, the target point. So the, the tubing was right here. And then eliminated tipan and then also showed that calcium concentration in this area was much higher than without tubing going into the tip and then blowing air in that microclimate. Yes. Yes. Transpiration of the shoot tip. But that increases calcium? Yes, yes, to the shoot tip. So is that different than what you would do for strawberries? In the strawberries, you want to reduce change. Right. Okay. So that's why I have strawberry example. Justin is asking about, you know, the, the, Putting airflow onto the shoot tip is increasing um, transpiration rate to increase the calcium flux. Okay, so strawberry, of course I thought about this, the same approach of lettuce. But the challenge is, so the lettuce, if you look at the sideway, the structure is like this, right? So the, right? So there is a shoot tip in here. And so you, if you put the um, vertical fan and then vertical airflow, it works the same way as, you know, pointing the tubing to the shoot tip. So that's a practical solution. So we, so we actually thought about that strawberry. But before even testing, we know that this doesn't work. This doesn't work really because... I don't know if you know the structure of strawberry, starting with roots, and then here is a crown, sort of squishing, and then leaf, 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 and then maybe fruits, like that, right? We can't see that. Oh, oh, sorry. <laughs> here you go, right? So the shoot tip is right here. Okay, and then you, you can see the canopy, so that this is a canopy, and completely, you know, inside the canopy. So the shoot tip is not exposed to the air. So unless, you know, I can design something so that, you know, the airflow is coming somewhere from here, and then blowing onto the shoot tip, unless I do that kind of engineering and design practically, and then usually impossible, um, I, I, I knew that, you know, airflow is not going to be a solution for strawberry. And then, sh and then transpiration is going from the leaf. Can you see? Yeah. From the leaf, right? From the leaf. And then basically the same situation as blossom and drop. So the big transpiration making allocation to the shoot tip limited. And therefore, calcium deficiency in the growing tip. And then that shows up when leaf develop like this. Or the calyx develop like that. So the solution for that, we, we, we decided to look at the night time. Um, night time, this is minimum. Stomates, stomata, close. Okay? So the, there is still transpiration going on from, you know, all over the surface. We call cuticular transpiration. It's not through the stomates, but through the um, epidermal layer. Um, and then that is probably 5% or 10%. I don't, I don't remember exact number, but very, very small transpiration. But during the night, still transpiring, and then that is... Um, reducing the xylem pressure. You know, that during the night, there is a, um, a, during the day too, but you know, the push from the roots, um, um, that's a water, um, you know, uptake by the roots. Um, so if the, this uptake is greater relative to the transpiration going on at night, then the whole system is pressurized 
and then the calcium mass flow driving calcium happens to the shoot tip. So I can't really increase this um, root pressure. Maybe I can do that by you know, warming up root zone. Increasing temperature is a good way to increase the root pressure. But I didn't have that you know, tool or means to increase the root zone pressure. So what I did was instead of um, you know, increasing root pressure, I reduced or completely eliminated the nighttime transpiration. How? Increasing humidity, nearly saturation, 95%. BPD, 0.1 kilopascal. Okay, so that was the target. And then under that conditions, this transpiration is almost none. And then still, root pressure is creating push pressurizing, as a result, you see gutation. Okay, gutation is a xylem, so it's unevaporated xylem. Usually, xylem flux, which is water basically, or some minerals, but that is gonna be evaporated as a transpiration. But when transpiration is limited because of the high humidity, then it, you can see as a liquid water coming from the leaf rather than evaporation, okay? So that's a great indication of high pressure. And then when I see gutation, that means um, um, calcium is supplied at um, good rate. And that was actually working for strawberry. Who's the phone? Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I thought somebody had a cell phone or something. But anyway, so. Yeah, so everything is explained by transpiration, how to manage transpiration, right? Um, tip pan for the um, strawberry, tip pan for lettuce, and brassamendrot for uh, tomato, but strategies are different. So, um, yeah, but um, that's right. So to to um, eliminate brassamendrot, um, you might be able to do the same way by nighttime temperature, but I don't know. Um, but usually, reduce the radiation. Yeah, but local, only here. Yeah, so I can tell you. Um, so the lettuce, so the lettuce, in a uh, um, vertical growing system, right? Lights are here, very shallow um, shelving unit, and that is the growing, okay? And then if you apply horizontal air like this, you can enhance transpiration, yes, but you can't solve the tip bound issue. And why? because this shoot tip is still protected in a maybe thick boundary layer because of the structure, because airflow doesn't go hitting the shoot tip. Therefore, even though transpiration is um, enhanced, the shoot tip transpiration is not enhanced, therefore this doesn't work. So actually this is a huge issue in the vertical growing system. Um, I'm hoping this approach can help you know, this kind of production system. Danielle? Did you say more tomatoes would decrease Yeah, yeah. Tomato solution is usually de decrease transpiration when, you know, the reason is too much transpiration going on. Then typical growers practice is put the shade and reduce the transpiration. And that increases calcium transportation? Or to the fruit. Yeah, because, uh, um, too much transpiration is reducing the uh, allocation to the fruit because uh, making the xylem more negative pressure. Okay, all right. Any time if you wanna review. But anyway, so that's, that's quite important um, information. One of the, um, I think, uh, milestone understanding of water and plants.
Um, so that's why I wanted to review. Okay, um, back to PC. Oh, there you go. Today, I'm going to talk about sink source relationship today. Um, that is also very important for um, crop production, any crop production. Oops. Oh, that's why I've done this. There you go. Okay. All right. Okay, one leading reference. Um, this is very classic. I think when you talk about sink source relationship, you can't go around holes in a massive amount of research. He's a um, he's in UK um, and did a lot of physiological study using tomato as a model crop. Um, I think reflecting um, the fact that you know UK um, had a lot of greenhouse industries doing tomato production, but um, it's it's a classic um, review papers. Uh, uh, it's it's twenty pages or so, but um, I want you to read so that you get a good, you know, the view, the current understanding, not the molecular level of understanding, um, but sort of whole plant um, understanding of sink source relationship translocation, which helps you to understand why we are doing this practice um, to grow plants in greenhouse. All right, so um, harvest index. How many of you have heard, heard of harvest index terminology, harvest index? Yeah, okay. So the harvest index is basically how much allocation, how much percentage of um, carbohydrate or photoassimilates or biomass allocated harvestable organ. So if um, your crop is like leafy crop, then harvest index is huge, right? most of the upper part, like a fresh head lettuce, is going to be harvested. And maybe outer leaves are removed, so the harvest index could be 80%, uh, including roots. So the roots and outer leaves are going to be out, but the rest is going to be harvestable, therefore it's very high. Fruiting vegetable harvest index is probably, depending on the crop, but 40% to 60% or 70%. Um, and then also grain crop is also that range, uh, I think 40% to 60%. So depending on the variety, depending on the growing condition, depending on the growing management, uh, harvest index changes. So the goal as a um, grower or R&D person um, of any crop production is enhancing or maximizing harvest index. You want to allocate the plant photoassimilates to the harvestable organ rather than leaves. But you can't do, you know, you can't create plants allocating 100% carbohydrate to the fruit. You know, it has to support leaves and roots to do a um, um, photosynthesis and take up water and, you know, so that's, that's there as a threshold, but you want to go as much as possible. You know, you want to go higher as possible. Okay, so understanding mechanism of translocation, how sugars are transported, translocated from leaves where, you know, the, the sugars are produced by photosynthesis to the final um, harvestable organ is very important. So that's why sink source relationship is very critical um, in the crop production physiology, like this, like this course. Okay, um, yeah, so um, the production technique can focus on photosynthetic rate if the harvest index is very high, because almost, you know, if you increase the photosynthesis, it make much bigger harvestable organ if ha harvest index is nearly 100%. For example, you know, transplants, 100% usable. Um, but if it is fruiting crop, photosynthetic rate can be enhanced, but not 
necessarily enhancing the harvestable um, organ. I can tell you the example. I was working on CO2 enrichment in the nursery production system, and then my CO2 enrichment worked. Um, it's a nursery to enhance the, the root biomass. So my plants having a huge root mass compared to other you know, non-CO2 enriched plants. But those plants are the mother plants for uh, uh, propagation. So the roots are really not <laughs> used for organs. I wanted to have more leaves, bigger leaves, and a bigger stem to be able to use as a propagation material. So the CO2 enrichment enhanced the total photosynthesis of the plants, but um, it really didn't, um, didn't affect the, um, the, the harvest index. All right, let me turn this on. Okay. Right. So this is um, someone's data showing tomato allocation of biomass uh, between different organs, fruits and leaves and stems. And it doesn't have roots because it's very challenging, as you can imagine, to get the root um, system extracted from the substrates and measure. Uh, and then in a um, hydroponic system, high wire system at the end, root biomass is quite negligible compared to stem and leaves and fruits. But you can see that the, the, the fruit harvest index, um, excluding roots though, um, is quite high. You know, the fresh mass based, 84% uh, out of the entire biomass of, up, you know, the, the aerial part of the growth. Um, dry mass wide, 71%. Okay, so a lot of allocation going into the fruit. And then this is, you know, the part of the um, results of long-term effort of, you know, improving um, variety, um, so the genetic improvement. Because I don't think wild-type tomato can produce that much of fruit allocation to the um, fruit. Um, uh, of the carbohydrate or photoassimilates, probably very small in a uh, wild type. Okay, so the photosynthesis you learn in a plant physiology, plant biology, um, as a process to produce sugar, and then you probably learn or will be learning the whole biochemical process. But my talk is focusing on what to do with the sugar produced in the photosynthesis. So, the sugar is produced in leaves and then translocated to sometimes long distance, you know, one meter away or more even. Um, you all know that, you know, how, how, how many meters of vine we have, sometimes 10 meter or so, right, in a tomato high wire system. So it could be very long distance. So the um, phloem is the system to transport sugar containing sap. Okay, and then uh, usually um, uh, um, the, the flow is based on, you know, the, the mass flow. It's not diffusion. So the sugar is translocated by mass flow rather than diffusion in the phloem. Okay, and, uh, um, and then that mass flow is basically based on pressure gradient. Pressure gradient. I, I'm going to explain that in um, in a minute. Um, and then phloem, as you know, xylem and phloem. Phloem is the one containing sugar, and xylem sap is um, not not containing, not supposed to contain sugar. Um, so the mechanism of translocation of uh, in the phloem of sugar um, is a pressure flow hypothesis. Is its current understanding. Uh, everyone uh, accept this. Uh, sugars are translocated in the phloem by mass transfer or mass flow along pressure, target pressure, um, a gradient between the source and sink. Um, and then to understand that pressure gradients, understanding loading and unloading of sugar or assimilate, photoassimilates, uh, is very important. I'll show you in here. Okay. 
Um, some of you probably learned this in uh, um, introductory plant physiology, but um, source and sink. So source is the, basically the site of photosynthesis. So the source of sugar, right? The site which is producing, producing sugar is the source. Sink is attracting sugar. So like fruit or a growing tip, shoot tip, um, suckers, um, growing roots, those are the sink, right? And then source, because it's photosynthesizing, sucrose is, you know, pro glucose produced and synthesized as sucrose and translocated. The sucrose is a typical sugar used as translocation, right? Some plants use different sugars, but sucrose is widely used in among different species. But anyway, so using sucrose as example, sucrose is produced in soul cell and then um, loaded into the phloem, you know, um, element, sheave element. And then loaded into, so it's, it's more active translocation, loaded in to the phloem. And then as a result, that concentration, sucrose concentration in this element, um, uh, you know, the section basically, is going to increase, right, easy. Um, sucrose is going to pump up to the, to the cell, therefore that concentration increase. Once it increases, what happens? Osmotic pressure or osmotic potential is changes, right? Yes. Yes, yeah, so think about leaf cell here. Leaf cell, sucrose is produced by photosynthesis, and sucrose is pumped into the phloem, and then the concentration right here, local concentration is high. So when sucrose is high, concentration is high, attract water to the um, um, phloem. Because it's, it's a, basically, it's very um, uh, 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 semi-permeable. Uh, material. So the right next to it, uh, maybe there's a small, it, it has a big space in here, but the, the, it's very close to that is a xylem, which containing basically water, right? Xylem sap is water, transpiration, water, and then the minerals. Um, and that water is coming into that zone, high sucre, sucrose concentration zone in the phloem. Water is coming in because of the water potential difference. You know, the water uh, or the um, less concentration of um, salts, therefore, uh, water potential here is obviously high or less negative, and this one is low or more negative, therefore, water is coming in. And that is create pressure, targa, okay? and. At the same time, if you look at the uh, sink cell, so the fruit cell, for example, or the shoot tip cell, growing shoot tip, or root tip cell, you know, the growing shoot, uh, root tip um, requires a lot of energy. So usually take up sugar, or sucrose in this case, from the phloem, pumping up, okay? And then that's um, unloading. All right, so that unloading sucrose from the phloem to the sink cell to use or store uh, in that cell. And then so that would reduce the sucrose concentration and um, because this is pressurized, so create the pressure difference, which is delta P in here, high pressure and low pressure. And that is basically pushing or creating mass flow from sink to the other way, source to sink, okay? And this diagram is showing source is up and sink is down, but it could be the other way, you know, because it's a pressure, it can be against the gravity, right, pushing up. So the sucrose could be translocated to upwards, okay? Sometimes you get confused, but that if you actually measure sucrose transportation by using a, maybe an um, a isotope or something, you know, then, then you can see that how much of the uh, carbon fixed by photosynthesis is located which direction. And so that's quite interesting. Um, and then Ho is the one, um, the Lim Ho, the, the author of the reading, he did a lot of study using uh, carbon uh, 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 13, 
um, N14. So the radioactive uh, isotope, and then also um, stable isotope. Um, he did a lot of study to find out the sink source relationship. Okay, so the loading site, um, there are two ways to, um, um, to move the sucrose from uh, source to the phloem. Um, one is simplest, so basically through the um, sort of bridge, which is, uh, which is called plasmo desmata. Um, so, so the sucrose never go across the plasma membrane. But there's a um, apoplast um, uh, unloading also, and then in that case, you got to go through some, you know, crossing the plasma membrane. And usually that is an energy requiring process. You have a special pump to take up um, the sucrose into the uh, sieve element. Uh, so there are two ways. Um, Unloading site, so the sink cell, so the fruit cell or shoot tip cell um, or growing tip cell of the roots, um, also symplastic pathway and apoplastic pathway. So the tomato, I have um, had that initially symplastic and then um, eventually apoplastic, apoplastic transportation is going to be dominated. And plants basically use a lot of energy to pump active transportation um, rather than symplastic. Because symplastic, there is no active transportation, pumping in, pumping out. It's just simple, you know, either pressure gradient or diffusion, right? And then, for example, sink cell, you can think about that. The fruit starts accumulating sugar. So the sugar concentration or sucrose concentration is, is going to be high in the sink cell maybe more than phloem. Okay, so now you have to still pump up sugar from low concentration side to high concentration side, and you definitely need energy to do that. Okay, and where the energy coming from? Respiration. Okay, so keeping the good respiration at the fruit side is very important. Okay, so I'm gonna show you hopefully today, if not, maybe Monday, the, one of the research examples showing, actually demonstrating, heating up tomato actually increased the yield. So, interesting, right? But if you understand this, makes sense. Energy, increasing temperature, increase the respiration, therefore more energy to pump the sugar into the, into the fruit cells. Right, um, so what's the speed of sap flow? Um, Again, this is a pressure flow, okay? It's not the diffusion rate. It's a pressure flow, um, the pressure bit difference between sink and source, loading and unloading sites. Um, and then it's about, what, 35, 70 centimeter per hour. So one hour, you can get this much of traveling, okay? This much of traveling, so it's not much. So it takes, so usually, so if you see the tomato and leaves, um, that sugar contained in the tomato is generally coming from nearby leaves, not like way, you know, in distance, usually around that. So having leaves very close to tomato is probably a, a good thing, right, for that reason, because otherwise it takes a long time to travel. Um, uh, so the, the flow rate can be expressed with sugar, um, transportation rate per um, hour and per diameter, cross-sectional area. And phloem pH seems to be um, high. And, uh, um, and then trans translocation is because um, driven by pressure flow, therefore unloading, loading affects that rate. Because it's unloading, loading sugar is creating the pressure, right? Okay, so this is, a, um, I thought, interesting paper to share. Um, this is a visualized um, a, a translocation, translocation of photoassimilate uh, sugar in a wheat uh, a, uh, uh, ear, wheat ear, yeah. And then uh, um, they use um, carbon-11 um, radioisotope, radioactive isotope, and then using certain, you know, wavelengths of light, 
uh, was a sensor to detect that um, uh, 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 radioactive ray. Radioactive ray? Yeah. So um, then you can actually visualize the sugar uh, translocation. So the CO2 is labeled using the um, carbon-11 in this case, and then visualize the um, translocation uh, uh, through the um, ear. So you, you can see that. So this is a five-minute interval, five-minute, 10-minute, 15-minute. And you can see that you know, the concentration is increasing, and sugar is traveling through the ear from, bo from the bottom to the top. It's really neat technology. It's really neat technology. Um, I wish we have that, something like that, because I'm very much interested in sink source relationship in strawberry, which has a relatively low sink strength compared to tomato, so it's not much attracting. And then I want to see how it is allocated and when and how we can promote that allocation so that fruit can be bigger, right, and sweeter. So that's uh, one thing I want to do uh, in the future, more uh, sophisticated research in terms of sink source. This is another example using the same approach. I think this is showing the allocation from the shoe to the root system. Again, this is um, uh, time wraps um, image. So 25 to 30 minutes, uh, five minutes later, uh, 10 minutes later, and then uh, what, 60 minutes later or so. So you can see that allocation um, from the leaves, obviously, to the sink, sink and source. And so the carbohydrate sugars um, trans transported, are transported from source and sink. It never goes sink and source, right? Okay, sink source relationship, and then there's a re relationship or interaction between sink and source. How much sink you have, how much source you have, affect the sink activity or affect source activity, which is interesting concept, but which is observed and understood. Um, so the source is the net, basically the source and sink um, are defined based on how much sucrose um, that organ can, be, can produce relative to how much transported to the outside. So here is the definition. Source is a net exporter or the producer of photoassimilate sugar. So more production uh, than it can consume by itself. Therefore, it, you know, it exports a lot of assimilates to other organs, to support other organs. That's the source. So the leaves, usually, you know, active leaves doing photosynthesis, obviously the source, right? But the growing teeny tiny leaf, you know, around the shoot tip, probably don't do too much photosynthesis. Rather, relying on much mature leaves for assimilates. So that's not source, small leaves. That's probably sink. So the leaves, uh, you know, biologically the same leaves, but it could be sink, it could be source, depending on the, you know, the uh, balance of the photo assimilates. Net exporter or net producer. Okay, then it is source. Sink is the net importer or consumer of photo assimilates. Leaf is a good example. Old leaf, think about old leaf sitting in the bottom of the canopy, not having enough light. Okay, they are not doing photosynthesis. And how they live and how they maintain their necessity, they need maintenance respiration to keep alive. And that energy is totally based on the sugar translocated to that leaf, right? And then that's sink, not source anymore, okay? New leaves are sink, yeah. Um, unfolded, fully expanded leaf are typically source. Where the transition starts, I don't know. It's an interesting question. Yeah, at some point, it changed from sink to source. Um, so it's growth rate, uh, growth rate uh, uh, related, um, you know, when um, leaf can be sink and source or come back to uh, sink at age. Um, 
Anyway, so photo assimilates are translocated from source to sink, never be sink to source. Okay, so this is tomato example. Um, mature leaves are typically source. Fruits and flowers, those are reproductive organs. Meristems, you know, growing tip. Other storage organs like roots and stem and tubers, those are sink. Okay, and sink source relationship is very important. Why? Because we know that removal of sink, for example, fruit, um, reduce photosynthesis. So it's removing sink, reduce photosynthesis. Removing fruits, reduce the leaf photosynthesis. So that's sink source relationship. Why? And also we know that remove, removing leaves, source organ, um, um, and then not touching any fruits, increase the remaining leaves photosynthesis. Okay? It's quite, so that it's, it's, it's almost like a communicating, but you can explain that using the understanding of sucrose translocation. And then one new concept you need to understand is the negative feedback of photosynthesis by accumulating sugar in the tissue. But anyway, so here is a um, typical observation with regard to sink source relationship in terms of photosynthesis of the leaf. So this is a time cause, so the, the photosynthesis over time, this is a continuous measurement, maybe continuous light intensity, right? 96 hours, it's a little bit long observation. Most likely consistent conditions in growth chamber rather than greenhouse. Uh, but if you don't do anything, and then plants are irrigated and fertilized, the 100% photosynthesis is going on in this particular leaf, at particular leaf age. But if you remove sink, which is in this case um, uh, ears, this is wheat actually, wheat plant, um, then you start seeing reduction of photosynthesis of the same leaf. So without removing sink, sink organs, Photosynthesis was maintained, but as soon as you remove the sink, photosynthesis decline. Okay, so that's, that's what I said in the previous slide. Um, why feedback inhibition is the, the well understood uh, mechanism behind the sink source relationship, particularly reduction of photosynthesis by removal of sink. So when sink is removed, you are missing the site of allocating, site of the sucrose, right, storage site. So the sucrose needs to go somewhere. But if you don't have enough sink, if you don't have enough storage capacity, the sucrose continuously produced by photosynthesis and then accumulate in the leaves. And that high sucrose content concentration reduces the enzyme you know, activities, and then reduce the whole photosynthetic rate. So that is called negative feedback caused by sucrose accumulation. So this is a chloroplast, it's photosynthetic, um, photosynthesis going on. And then um, hexose um, basically come out and then uh, synthesized into sucrose. And then that process uh, have one key enzyme um, which is called hexokinase. And that is very sensitive to the sucrose or sugar concentration in that cell. And then if sucrose is accumulating, it's reduced. Because why we need to you know, produce more sucrose? <laughs> There's a whole bunch of sucrose sitting in the cell. So it's reduced the enzyme activities and no more sucrose synthesis and uh, um, uh, 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 Phosphate is going to be reduced, and then that doesn't come in, and then we call recycle um, mechanism, and that is reduced and slowing down um, photosynthesis. So, so that's the sort of uh, little bit of physiological explanation. But remember, when sugar accumulates, then feedback inhibition happens. So, okay, back to this, right? So, sink was removed again. Therefore, sucrose lost significant portion of allocation, right? Or potential allocation. Therefore, it doesn't get allocated 
right? Therefore, accumulate in the cell, therefore, reduce the photosynthesis. Okay, sink source relationship. Um, this is strawberry example. Um, this is over the day. Photosynthesis was measured consistent conditions. It's a leaf chamber method. And so during the day, <coughs> measurement was done. And uh, as you can see, um, early morning it's very high in photosynthesis. And then during the day, it's declined over time. And then <coughs> during the end of the day, <coughs> it's probably half, isn't it? Close to half. <coughs> the, um, sorry, I need to call. And the uh, measurement was done using artificial conditions, the chamber method. So if plants have the same capacity, it should show straight line because the same leaf is sampled. And, but it's declining, so that means something is reducing photosynthetic capacity. And one way to explain this is the negative feedback. So strawberry, maybe the sink, you know, strength is very small. Um, so that's attracting power of the sugar at the sink side, in this case fruit. Therefore, maybe leaves accumulating a lot of sugar over time, and therefore morning photosynthesis is much higher than toward the end of the day because of the different sucrose concentration in the leaves. All right. Um, so, and then another important understanding using sink source relationship is allocation of the simulate. TJ? Um, is the idea that during the day, the leaves are storing up the sugar, and then at night, it's being consumed? That way, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. they're able to yeah. do more photos. Recover, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the reason, it's a good question. Um, the reason high photosynthesis early in the morning is because sugar is consumed during the night or translocated, you know, using that long hours of night. Therefore, the leaf sugar concentration is much lower at the beginning of the day, maximizing the capacity of photosynthesis. Good question. Yeah, so let's talk about allocation. Um, uh, here, we are going to understand the um, competition between sink, uh, between Sink, between sink organs. Um, okay. Uh, partition or partitioning of a simulate among sinks. Um, factors affecting, uh, one thing we, we mentioned, distance um, effect. Uh, you know, so that instead of fruit far away from this leaf, the, the fruit nearby leaf is going to take up most of the photoassimilates produced by that leaf. So that's a distance, you know, influence. And then also how much sink strength is there. And then sink strength is a very, very vague concept. You really can't measure it. It's a how much um, respiration going on or growth rate of the, you know, uh, organ. And then also size, if it is big, fast growing fruit <laughs> or small, slow growing fruit. So that's basically the sort of the vague understanding I wish I can quantify the strength of zinc so that it's easy to um, understand some of the, um, uh, uh, you know, photosynthesis we, we are seeing in, uh, in different crops. But anyway, so, so those two are uh, basically affecting um, uh, uh, allocation of um, photoassimilates or sugar. And um, um, if you have many zinc organs, the competition going on, and then um, that's exactly the reason you remove the number of fruits, you know, fruit pruning, because the source is the same. And then allocation, if you have more fruits, the fruit, individual fruit allocation is getting small. Therefore, fruit size is going to be smaller. You want to increase the fruit size bigger. In that case, you want to remove some of the fruits so that allocation per fruit is going to be increased. So that's a basic reason of doing fruit pruning or flower pruning. 
And then also sakka removal. Sakka is the sink also, right? You don't want to grow out the big sakka. It's useless. Rather, you want to allocate the limited photoassimilates into the fruit rather than sakka. So you want to remove it as soon as possible. So that's basically managing sinks, um, sink organs. All right. OK, uh, I mentioned that sink strength is a vague um, um, concept, but sink strength is generally considered as uh, proportional to the size and proportional to the activities, particularly respiration rate, um, growing respiration, or growth respiration. That's probably the terminology. Um, bless you. Um, and then sink compete. And then plants have somehow priorities, which I don't know how, but it's probably research, more, more basic research going on. Why, you know, one organ, one type of organ has more priority in terms of allocation. But anyway, and then that changes um, depending on the stage of the growth. Tomato, again, it's a good example because Ho did a lot of study on tomato. Um, young tomato plants. The priority or the sink strength um, is always high in roots than young leaves or flowers. So flowers are usually the, the, the lowest priority. So the strength is higher in roots than leaves and then flowers. So if something happens, conditions are not really good for um, maintaining a, a normal growth, young, plant, young tomato plants could abort flowers. They just give up. You know, I'm not ready to allocate, you know, assimilate to the flowers. So the more roots, more leaves. Okay, so that's typical you see in young plants. However, getting to more mature fruiting tomato plants, and then you start seeing fruits having the highest priority. And then young leaves and flowers and roots are going to be the, the least. I have seen that in strawberry plants. Whenever we have massive load of fruits, of strawberries, roots cannot grow. And then I can see as pH change. pH, if it is actively, you know, uh, 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 functioning roots there, then I start seeing usually higher pH than in, a, in the root system than incoming nutrient solution. Because you remember nitrate taking up and then increase the pH because um, the um, hydrogen ion needs to go together to, to balance um, um, you know, between the uh, inside and outside of the cell. But anyway, so that is a normal action. But when plants are not growing roots, you know, root growth is stopped, then typical symptom I see in the strawberry is all the sudden pH starts declining rather than going up because it's not working and then maybe uh, uh, decomposting, you know, maybe uh, 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 releasing lots of uh, organic acids to the root zone or something, that is a good indicator. But anyway, so I know that, you know, roots stop when too much fruit load. So I need to remove the fruits or remove the flowers to, to balance out um, the, the strawberry plants. But anyway, so, so that's another example. Um, this one, I, okay, so this is, many students ask the difference for this, and then I, I still don't really locate the real chap. This is a book chapter. And actually, the Marshall and Sager, Sager um, this is cited by someone else, my, uh, one of my plant physiology textbooks. Uh, published in Japan, so I can't really show. I can show, but you probably don't understand. But anyway, but I'm looking, still looking for the original chapter, which I haven't located. I, I know the title, I know, so I'm gonna uh, probably, I guess some, a student requested, but they didn't get that copy from the library because of the limited information. But anyway. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Would will, will removing fruit cause more allocation to other 
Yeah. Yeah. There is a competition um, between zinc organs, and then different stages of plants have priority um, of the allocation. So when you want to save the root growth, like in my strawberry example, you need to remove the highest priority or strongest things, which is fruits. Yeah, well, developing fruits is a strong. But like so if you have tomatoes, you have yeah. very uh, developed tomatoes and you have young tomatoes. Yeah, which one is? Growing tomato is the probably most influential rather than removing mature, maximized size fruit. That's my understanding. However, Back to the previous slide, sink strength is coming from size and then also activities. So the size-wise big fruit is obviously big, but activity of the small fruit is much higher. So I don't really... So that can be Okay, okay. Um, large tomatoes, do they just, is there a point where they stop? They don't stop. The, the question, I mean, the stop of attracting sugar, right, yeah. you're asking. Yeah, so the large fruits, still attracting sugar. Because um, that's why when you harvest fruit, um, after fully mature, fully ripen, sugar concentration is in highest, usually highest. Um, middle point, it's still, you know, low, because, because sugar allocation is keep going, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I'm running out of time today. We come back, and this is, this is a good stuff. All right, so how much do I have? Um, uh, uh, uh. Oh, okay, not bad, not bad. We, we are good. So we start with this um, um, funky um, uh, diagram uh, Monday, okay? <laughs>